Hey everyone, this is Rohan Shah with BestEconTutor.com and in this video we'll be talking about accounting and economic profits, marginal analysis, and behavioral economics. So, first, let's talk about accounting profits and economic profits. Here's what they have in common. They're both just revenues minus costs. That's what profits really is, right? Now, accounting profits is what you think about in the real world, right? So, well, let's look at a specific scenario. Let's say you're graduating from college, you have a job offer for $50,000, but instead you decided to start your own business. Now. In that business, let's say if you were to work for the year, you would make $100,000 in revenues and you would have a $40,000 operating cost. So that means cost for paying rent, paying your employees, all that jazz. So here's a question. What are your profits? If you were to ask an accountant, what are your profits? What would they say? Well, they would say that you made $60,000 because Hey, you made 100 in revenues, you spent 40 of it, so you came home with 60,000. But if you were to ask an economist, what are your profits? They would say that, well, yeah, sure, you made 100,000, but your total costs are not just the operating costs, but also the opportunity cost. So if you recall what opportunity cost is, that's the value of your alternative. See, by running your business for the whole year, what you're giving up on is the $50,000 you could have earned, right? So that's kind of a cost. You're giving that up by spending the time running your business. So an economist would say that your profits are only $10,000. So if we wanted to come up with formulas for these, we would say that the accounting profits... One point on notation. Pi. No relation to 3.14. In economics, it's a pretty common thing to use pi for profits. You might think, why not just use P? Well, we're already using P for price, right? So that's why. So accounting profits really are just your total revenues minus just the physical cost. That's also called explicit costs. Explicit costs. So that's anything that you physically pay versus your economic profits are your revenues minus your total cost. So one way to think about it is it's minus the explicit costs, but also minus the implicit or opportunity costs. So that's the thing. If you think about it, if you wanted to even relate them further, notice that what they have in common is that they're both revenues, what you bring in, minus your physical costs, right? That's your accounting profit. Economic profits just go one step further. So you can even say that your economic profits are equal to your accounting profits, but then you also have to subtract the implicit costs or opportunity costs. So that's why if you think about it, your economic profits, you could have said, well, you made 60,000 physically in profits, but you kind of gave up the 50 and that's how we got the 10. Now let's look at what would happen in the same scenario if your operating costs were actually 50,000. Now in that case, if we want to know what our accounting profits are, well, 100,000 in revenues minus the 50,000 in operating costs, so that's $50,000. And now if you were to look at your economic profit, well, it's the accounting profit minus the opportunity cost, so minus the 50,000 that you're giving up, but 50 minus 50 is zero. So, hmm, what does that mean if you have zero economic profits? Does that mean you're starving? Well, clearly not because your accountant's telling you that you made $50,000 that year. So here's what economic profit really means practically in the real world. It's basically saying how much more or less of it's negative you're making by running your business compared to your job. So if your economic profit is zero, that just means you're not doing any better or worse than if you had a job and you were making $50,000. So that's the thing. One big conclusion we'll come to in the next module and a couple modules later is that all firms in the long run make a zero economic profit. 
but that doesn't mean they're starving. That just means every business owner on average in the long run will make about the same as if they would have had a job instead. Now, let's finally kind of look at what would happen in this case if your operating costs were 70,000. Well, in that case, your accounting profit would be 100 minus 70, so it'd be 30,000. And your economic profits, though, would be the 30,000 that you physically made, 100 minus 70, but minus the $50,000 opportunity cost, so that's negative 20,000. So again, if you have a negative $20,000 economic profit, that doesn't mean that you have to take a loan or that you're in debt or anything like that, but that just means that you made 20,000 less than if you were to have a job, because hey, you made $30,000 that year, which is just 20 less than if you were to have a job instead. So now let's talk about marginal analysis. Basically, that's gonna be the key for the rest of the course really on how we're gonna analyze problems. And really we've kind of already seen it with supply and demand. Supply and demand were marginal benefit and marginal cost. So here's the issue. Let's say, and let's just sort of see why it works and how you're gonna be working with it if you're given a table and whatnot. So let's say you're given a basic problem like this where you're given the benefit and cost of doing something. So let's say you're deciding to go trick-or-treating and you're wondering how many houses should you hit up tonight? So uh, let's say the first house, if you were to do one house, you'd get a hundred dollar happiness in your mind and it would cost you ten dollars worth of sort of time. So again, all these are kind of, you know, almost metaphors, right? So it's not really saying that you're physically giving up ten dollars, but it's just kind of quantifying how much your cost is, even though it's not a physical dollar cost, that's, that's what that is. So your goal is to have, you know, your total benefit be as much higher than the cost as possible, right? So looking at this, yeah, we could kind of, you know, go through every one and try to find your benefit minus your cost for every single one and see where that's the highest. And that's sort of one way you can kind of verify your answer. But as you'll see, it becomes much more efficient if you were to look at the marginal values instead of the total values. So here's the thing. We'd have to go through each one, and even then we kind of aren't sure necessarily in the real world, but with the marginal analysis, you'll sort of be able to efficiently get the right answer once you have the numbers. So first, let's talk about how do you find the marginal values based on the total values. So if we're given the total benefit, we wanna find the marginal benefit, here's what we're gonna do. Well. Going from zero to one house, your benefit goes up by 100. So your marginal, marginal just means the next value, your marginal benefit for that first house was 100. Now the going from one to two, that was also, it went up by 100. So you see your marginal benefit there was also 100 because that's how much the second one added. So really you're just finding the difference. It's the change in the total benefit, technically divided by the change in quantity, but here the quantity is going up by one every time. So we're just looking at the difference here. Going from two to three houses, you went from a benefit of 200 to 280. So that went up by 80. So we can say then that the third one alone added an $80 happiness. You got an $80 benefit from going to that third house alone. Marginal is the next one. So here to here, 280 to 320, that's 40. And that's gonna be 10. So these are your marginal benefits for each extra house. Notice it typically goes down, right? Because the more of something you do, the less the next value adds to it, right? The going from the fourth house to the fifth house didn't give you as much more excitement as going from the first to the second house did. Marginal cost typically goes up because by then you're getting more and more tired and whatnot. So uh, here, notice the first one's usually a, a dash because there's nothing before it. But going from zero to one, that's a cost of 10. Going from one to two, that went up by 20, right? 10 to 30, so it's really just the difference. It went up by 20. Here it went up by 30. So again, what this is saying is the third house added $30 to your cost. Your cost went from 30 to 60. Here it went up by 40, and here it went up by 100. So, now that we have our marginal benefits and our marginal costs, we can easily figure out the best quantity. All we have to do is look at where they're equal to each other, technically. Now, here, that's over here, so we know that the answer is going to be 
four houses. So we want a quantity of four and that's where we're going to maximize our sort of total profits or total utility. So the reason is this. Here's the reasoning. The question is, should you go to the first house? Well, the benefit for the first house alone is 10 and the cost uh, 100 and the cost is 10. So that exceeds that, right? So by doing that, you're going to add 90 to your profits. So you might as well do that. The second one, should you do it? Well, again, you're adding 100. It only costs you 20. So you're adding $80 to your profit. So yeah, you might as well do it. The third one, same thing where the benefit outweighs the cost. The marginal benefit outweighs the marginal cost. Here's basically the golden rule in economics. If the marginal benefit outweighs the marginal cost, do it. If the marginal cost outweighs the marginal benefit, don't do it. So here, should we go to the third house? Well, yeah, the extra benefit, we get 80 more dollars in happiness. It only costs us 30 to do it. So we'll add 50 to our profits by doing it. So yeah, we should do it. Should we do the fourth one? Well, here's where it's kind of weird because we're not really adding anything to our profits, but we're not losing anything either. So by convention, if it's adding zero, we do it anyway. So that's just a convention throughout all economics courses. Uh, if there's uh, an equal benef marginal benefit and marginal cost, you'll do it anyways. You're not really gaining anything more, but you're not losing anything. So we just had to pick until we picked that you'd do it. So there's that. But should you go to the fifth house? Well, the cost will outweigh the benefit by 90. So that means that if you were to go from four to five houses, then your profits would go down by, by, by that 90 because you're sort of losing that which makes sense because here your profits are 220 because your total benefit for the four houses is 320 minus 100. Your profits here are, are 220, but your profits here are only 130. So notice your profits went down. In fact, if you wanted to look at your profits at every single point, here it's 90. Your profits here, 200 minus 30 is 170. Your profits here are 220. So out of all of these, this is the best one. Again, technically, three also gave you the same, but we'll just choose the higher quantity if it's a tie. Now let's talk a little bit about behavioral economics. Here's the thing. For mainstream economics, we make a lot of assumptions, most of which aren't true in the real world. The biggest assumption being that people are rational. They behave rationally uh, and that they think at the margin. Now, that's not true in the real world every time. In fact, if you were to look at uh, a lot of examples in the real world, so for example, uh, one thing is that we assume that all businesses, you know, when they're maximizing profits, right, that's, they're doing the best that they can. They've done the marginal benefit, marginal cost, they've optimized. Now, let's say you were to ask a real life small business owner or something who might not necessarily be thinking about economics, and you were to ask them, hey, if your landlord were to increase your rent, what should you do? They'll probably say something like, oh, well then I'll probably have to sell more items or something, you know, because they're thinking to make up for it. But here's the thing, if they were being rational as economics often assumes, then the thing is they would think, all right, well, rent is a part of my fixed cost. So it's not really affecting my marginal values. So I really, if I'm maximizing profits already, I really shouldn't change anything if the only thing that's changing is a fixed cost and my marginal values aren't affected. Because here's the thing, if you were to, if you could somehow make more profits now by selling more items when your rent went up, well, you could have done, the, make those changes before your rent went up and, and made those more profits. So here's the thing, so if you're already maximizing your profits and if a fixed cost changes, if your marginal values don't change, you know, rationally, you shouldn't do anything. But, so that's what behavioral economics studies. Behavioral economics is basically studying issues, you know, things, instances where psychology sort of overtakes rationality. Like, you know, people often behave irrationally in cases like that. And there's many different reasons why. It's, it's sort of a newer branch of economics. So it's still very much an evolving, it's an evolving phase. So uh, another example kind of, if you were to ask somebody, hey, if you were, uh, if Facebook started charging a dollar a month, to be a member, what would you do? A lot of people would say, oh yeah, then I would totally not, not use Facebook at all. But if they were thinking rationally, chances are if they're on Facebook for several hours a month and they're actually getting some benefit out of it, well, rationally, they should be probably willing to pay at least a dollar for that. But the psychology of it is this. 
they're used to it being free. So they're sort of thinking that their value, that the value is zero. And so if they have to now pay for it, they probably won't want to. But if Facebook had charged a dollar a month from the very beginning, a lot more people would think more rationally because then they wouldn't have that issue of, you know, the time inconsistency there. So all that falls under behavioral economics, but you know, it's usually not tested in introductory economics, but just know that it's out there. Now let's look at some questions from students. When in the real world would you use economic profits versus accounting profits? Now, that's a good question. Here's the thing, in the real world, when we're communicating with people, when we're filling out our tax returns, we really always use accounting profits. Economic profits is not something that you're physically gonna talk about necessarily or you know use, but it's something that you have to think about when making decisions. So if you're deciding, hey, was this really profitable even though my accounting profits might have been a million, oh, well, if I had an opportunity cost, if I had the chance to make two million elsewhere, then that's really a negative economic profit, right? So you wouldn't really use economic profits physically to fill out your tax returns or anything like that or to communicate with most people as far as, oh yeah, our profits were, you know, you don't really report your economic profits. It's something that you use to make decisions of, do I wanna even stay in business in the long run? Because, hey, even though I'm making a positive accounting profit, if my economic profit's negative, you know, then you probably want to not stay in business. Now let's look at another question. Why do we bother with marginal analysis? Can't we just find the profits at each point and see where it's maximized? Now, that's a good point. In the example that we saw, you know, we could have just found the profit at every point and see which one was the highest and we could have been done there. Now, the reason it's kind of better to do marginal analysis, a lot of it's because the principle of it is that it's, it makes more sense practically that you, know, you wanna do something when the benefit marginally outweighs the cost and you don't wanna worry about the, the, song, you know, the rent and all that stuff, any fixed cost. But practically, it's a lot more efficient. Notice that to find the profit maximizing point, you technically have to look at every single point. Now here, we only had six data points. If you had like 100 data points, you'd have to check every single one and only then can you be sure that you've maximized profit when you find the highest one. But with the assumptions we make in economics, for the marginal analysis, you could stop once you found where marginal benefit equals marginal cost. So once you find that one point, you don't need to check every other data point because then you know, ah, that's the highest. Anything after that's gonna make me less and less profits because the cost will keep outweighing the benefits. So that's, it's more efficient is the short answer to why you'd wanna use marginal analysis and that way you can be sure without having to check every single data point. Well, I hope you now understand economics better. And if you really want to make sure you've mastered the concept, check out our active learning customized platform at bestecontutor.com. It's like having a one-on-one -on -one tutor right in front of you 24 seven. You can click here to try it out for free. And we'll be adding more topics and videos on YouTube. So make sure you subscribe below for the latest updates.